Dragon Slayer 2. Buckle in everybody, it's gonna be a long one. A ton of cool stuff unlocked with this quest, including access to the Myths Guild with red, green, blue, and black dragons in the basement, access to the Wrath Altar, and being able to fight Adamant and Rune Dragons, and unlocks a new boss to fight. Bunch of requirements for this one, everything pictured here, and none of these are boostable in any way. Well, except combat, that's just a recommendation since there are some tough fights in this quest. For reference, these are the combat stats I had when beating the quest. Each of these boss fights took me a couple attempts, but they were incredibly far from perfect. In addition to the 200 quest points and quests listed here, you also need to have started barbarian fire making, which you can check if you've done this by grabbing some logs and any standard fletchable bow and then use it on the logs. If they light, then you've done it. If not, then you need to grab a bow and an axe and go talk to Otto, who lives in the house south of the barbarian outpost and talk to him until you're able to light the logs. Here's the main items for this quest. There are a lot of opportunities to bank and pause, so no big deal if you skip something right now. Most of the items are stuff you'll probably already have in your bank, with the exception of Goutweed. I'll come back to that in just a moment. There are also a lot of locations to get to, and I'll explain things as we go. There are a lot of points where we'll stop and bank in the GE, so I'll let you know what stuff you'll need when as we go. Okay, back to the Goutweed. If you are not lucky enough to have one in your bank from when you did Edgar's Ruse, you'll need to steal one from the Troll Stronghold. You could also buy a Gout Tuber and farm it, but it is well over a million coins at the time of this video, so I'm going to show the Stronghold way quickly before starting the quest, and skip ahead if you've already got it. Put on your Graceful if you've got it, and grab a Troll Stronghold teleport or two Fire Runes, two Law Runes, a teleport out, and probably some energy or stamina potions and food if you're not great at the sneaky past NPCs mechanic. Teleport to the troll stronghold and make your way down the mountain. And into the stronghold entrance. Run south down the hallway and you'll find some stairs, go down them. There'll be another set of stairs to the north, head down them. And run down the long hallway. I'm going to turn the camera a couple times here just to make it easier. You might remember this part from Edgar's Ruse if you've done it recently. Uh, I haven't. <laughs> But there's a troll down at the end of the storehouse guarding the goutweed crate and you just have to wait until no trolls are looking and then run. Your first spot should be this one in the middle. Next you can run around to the other side of where you're standing. And from there wait again until it's safe and then run for the crate. You'll get your goutweed and a bonk on the head. Okay, bruised but goutweed in tow, we can now start the quest. There's conveniently a spirit tree right by the quest start, so you can safely bank your goutweed for now and make your way to the GE to gear up for the first part of the quest. Like a lot of quests, we start off by bopping around and talking to some people so we're graceful, but bring along weapons, gear, and food to take down a single level 100 enemy. It's not a hard fight, but it's meant to be more of a jump scare. So I'm bringing a crossbow and some broad bolts plus dragon hide. Also, I pretty much will have an amulet of glory and dueling ring on this whole quest, just for easy teleports to banks more than anything, but for this part we'll use the glory's teleport to Karamja. Also, make sure you bring a pickaxe and a dig site pendant and some stamina or energy potions to make the running parts go faster. And keep seven inventory spaces, or you may have to dump some food at some point. When you're ready, make your way to the spirit tree to the northeast of the GE and pick Feldip Hills. And then run north and cross the bridge.
talk to Alec Kincaid, who is the official start of the quest. Ask him how you can gain access to the guild. You've got to prove yourself by discovering where dragons come from and who they serve, and then he'll let you in. Agree to his challenge and away we go. First up, we gotta talk to a guy in Musa Point who knows some stuff. Pretty easy to get to, just use your Karamja teleport on your Amulet of Glory and head into the building with the beer icon. Find Dallas Jones and give him a chat. He wants to do some research on Elvarg, who is the dragon we killed in Dragon Slayer 1. So you can skip the story when given the option. He says to meet him in the old Elvarg lair. From here, it's a short run over to the dungeon entrance a bit to the west. Head down into the volcano and run north. There are some demons that are aggressive, so you can just pray or put on armor if you want. But otherwise, just head through the wall and run past them to the north. Once you see these spikes on the right, find the short ones and click for the option to climb over the wall. A few steps more and you'll see old Dallas. He'll talk a bit about Elvarg and how odd it was that she lived alone, away from other dragons, and says we should check the lair for clues. How about this suspicious looking wall over here? Click it to mine it and we'll get a tunnel. Let's head on through. Well, this is fancier than I expected for the inside of a volcano. Dallas says it might be a lab of an ancient race called Dragonkin that created the dragons and we should poke around to see what we can learn. At this point, swap to your armor if you're still wearing your graceful. On the east side of the room, you'll see an option to inspect ancient machinery. Click it to obtain some old notes, then go north to investigate the ancient mural. That will prompt the spawn to attack you. Straightforward fight, nothing special. Then inspect the ancient mural again and we learn the word Lithkrin. Chat with Dallas and he says he's seen Lithkrin before on Fossil Island, so that's where we're off to next. Hopefully your dig site pendant has an option for Fossil Island. If yes, use that. If not, take the teleport to the dig site. Right click on the barge guard to quick travel and run the rest of the way to the house on the hill. To unlock the Fossil Island teleport, use your dig site pendant on the strange machine. Make sure it says that it binds its magic because it's actually a toggle on or off, not a one-time thing. Next, climb down the trapdoor to the southeast. Surprise, it's Dallas again. Talk to him, he says there's an island called Lithkrin we should visit and that the floor could be a map to it. But we've got to find the missing 24 pieces of the map. It's not as bad as it sounds though, we actually only have to check five places, starting with the open chest right here. Try to use a piece of the map on the floor and then Dallas will take them off you, opening up some inventory space. The other four spots to find map pieces are the stone chest just north of the trap door has three pieces, and whenever you run out of inventory, head back to Dallas and offload pieces to him. Exiting the house, the fungi to the north of the staircase has four pieces. The hook briar around the south has seven pieces. And the mush tree to the east of the building has the final five pieces. And then use one of them on the floor map. He'll ask if you want to solve the map, so say let's do it! To solve the map, you have to rearrange and rotate the pieces until it looks like this. As soon as you get it correct, it will automatically close, so if you think it's done but it's not closing, just double check all the rotations. With the map finished, we just need a way to get to Lithgren Island. Dallas suggests talking to his buddy Jardik to get a boat. Jardik is in the main museum camp, so head out of the house on the hill and down to the beach, to near where you arrive from the dig site. Talk to Jardik, he says, yeah, nah, all the boats belong to the museum, we've got to build our own, so run over to the bank and let's bank. 
This next section doesn't have any combat, so wear your graceful again. For inventory, I had my Ring of Dueling and Dig Sight Pendant just in case I needed to bank anything, but that was just as a precaution. You will need the building supplies, so oak planks, swamp paste, nails, hammer, saw, as well as a teleport to Varrock and your cat speak amulet are handy to have. Once you're ready, head west out of the beach and into the mushroom forest. Follow this path until you see the big yellow mushroom tree, and then go west past it. And on the beach, you'll find where we need to build the boat. You actually might not use all the nails. I had us bring 20 just in case a few get broken. And ta-da, we've got a boat. Click it and tell Dallas that you're ready. We'll row the boat to Lithkrin. and then run north and west-ish. And go up these stairs when you see them, and then down this trap door. And then down some stairs, and then down through this chamber, down some more stairs, and here's Dallas an expert observationist, he notes that there are dragons on the doors, but they are locked. Click the skeleton over here and you'll find a diary. Page through it a bit and it turns out Robert the Strong, aka Bob the Cat, was leading some attacks against the dragonkin many years ago. Talk to Dallas and upon relaying this fun fact, he hits us with an old school classic. To find out more about the dragonkin, we've got to find Bob the Cat. The two ways to find him are either to go to one of the places he hangs out, like the anvils in Varrock, and world hop until you find him, or use the cat speak amulet to track him down. I'd suggest using your teleport to Varrock and starting there. You might be super lucky and find him right away. I tried the world hopping method, but I kept getting kicked out for switching too much, so I said screw it and just decided to use the amulet to track him down. To use the amulet, right click on it to open, and then you can click on the whiskers <laughs> to rotate the light colored section until the eyes light up to point to whichever direction Bob is from you. So I was in Birthorp, and ultimately he was in Drainer Manor for me, so it's pointing me to the southeast. Here is a map of reported locations according to the wiki, but this might not be a complete list. It does seem to be confined between the mainland, between Al Karid and East Ardoin, so uh, best of luck. Once you find him, put on the cat speak amulet and talk to him. Make sure it's Bob, not his companion. Bob says he doesn't remember anything from his past life, so we've got to get to the Sphinx in Sofenem to hypnotize him. Stop by a bank and pick your favorite way to get to soften him. A Pharaoh's Scepter will get you straight to soften him with the Jal Savra teleport. You can take the magic carpets from Shante Pass to Palnivnich to soften him. Uh, so bring a couple hundred coins if Ikthurin's little help request is completed. A Narda teleport, either a Teletab or your Desert Amulet 2 Plus, and run through the desert. And just bring your cat speak amulet and a teleport out. You do not need any other special items or gear. Once in Sofenem, go southeast of the pyramid plunder pyramid to talk to the Sphinx. And uh, make sure you have your amulet on. Although first item of business is that the Sphinx grants us power to talk to cats without the amulet. Okay, cool. That's at least something, because the Sphinx can't help us with anything else, so we're going to have to go to the Oniromancer on the Lunar Isle. For this next section, we're going to go to Lunar Isle to make a potion and then fight Robert the Strong. There is a bank on Lunar Isle, so you don't have to wear your gear for the potion making part, but before we head to the Lunar Isle, I'll go over some potential gear you might want, in case you need to pick up anything at the GE. Robert the Strong attacks with range and is weak to crush attacks, so accordingly you'll want ranged defense gear and a crush weapon. He has a regular max hit of 34 and a special attack that can hit over 50, so I'd say take the fight pretty seriously. There is an item collection chest that will hold all the items you lose if you die, but it does cost 100k per use. 
He has extremely high defense against ranged and magic, so you're gonna need to use melee. One of the best sets would be Varrock the Defiled, but the budget option is Granite Set and a Leaf Bladed Battle Axe or Dragon Mace. In some of the footage, you'll see me running around with a Whip and Rune Armor. Ignore that, that was just me being a snuggle derp. And of course you'll want some good food, super combat potions, and prayer potions. Okay, I'm gonna come back to the details of the fight later. Let's get to Lunar Isle and make the potion. For that, we'll need a way to Lunar Isle. I strongly recommend using a Lunar Isle teleport, that is super easy. Otherwise, you can make your way to Relica, find a low-car sea runner, go to the Pirate's Cove, talk to the Pirate Captain, and then get to Lunar Isle. You'll also need your Seal of Passage, since no one will talk to you on the island if you don't. If you've lost it for whatever reason, you can get a new one from Brunt the Chieftain in Relica. You'll need all the other things here, and your gout weed. When you're ready, head to the Lunar Isle. Make your way to the Aneromancer near the Astral Altar. Ask her about Bob's memories. You can say no thanks when she offers an explanation about how the potion is made. She'll give you a vial and you can head into town. There's a sink in the building next to the bank where you can fill up the vial with water. Next, use the gout weed on the vial of water. And then use the hammer on the astral rune to get some rune shards. And then use them on the pestle and mortar. And finally, add them to the vial as well. Alright, let's gear up for our first boss fight. Head next door to the bank and put on your crush attack range defense gear. I'm showing the gear here I actually used to defeat him. Again, the rune and whip were not a great combo, but granite and leaf blade battle axe did the trick. In your inventory, keep your seal of passage, tinderbox, and dream potion vial. Then grab your super combat potion, a prayer potion since you'll want to pray protect from range the whole fight, a bunch of good food, and an emergency teleport out. From here, it's just a short walk to this long building to the west. Head on in and use your tinderbox and dream vial on the ceremonial brazier. Interestingly, if you don't make it on your first attempt, you don't have to do the tinderbox and vial again, you can just talk to Bob to enter the dream. So you can get an extra two spots for food and potions. Also, if you die in the fight, this is the chest you use to reclaim your items. So when you enter the dream, you're in a safe area. Talk to the white cat, not Bob, and he says to recover the memories, we have to defeat the guardian who is on the other side of the barrier. Before entering the arena, make sure your weapon is set to crush, drink your potions, and turn on your range protection prayer. He hits pretty hard through the range prayer you'll see, and he has one special attack to look out for. When he yells, see if you can hide from this, you have to immediately run and hide behind a pillar or he'll hit you for some nasty damage. He'll then teleport you back to the center. I'd recommend keeping the screen pretty zoomed out so you can quickly click behind the pillar. Once you beat him, you'll go directly to a cutscene flashback where Robert and co beat up a dragonkin who drops a key to the door we need to open. Robert says him and his buddies split the key into four pieces. Of course they did. So we've got to find all four pieces. Key pieces can be done in any order you want. If for whatever reason you want to skip a section and come back to it, you can. This is a good place to take a break if you need it, but otherwise, we're heading to Karamja. Can't wait. For this section, we're going to be running through a dungeon maze with a bunch of traps and enemies attacking us. It wouldn't be a Grand Master quest otherwise. You'll see me with a crossbow in the footage, but you actually don't need a weapon for any reason. I'd recommend wearing some sort of armor that gives you a good range of protection types since we'll be getting hit with melee, ranged, and magic. Also we'll be using protection prayers, so prayer boost items are good. You'll need a way to get to the Shiloh Village area. If you have Karamja Gloves 3+, plus, 
you can use the teleport to Shiloh Village. Otherwise, I'll show the route taking the spirit tree and gnome gliders from the GE. Bring an axe and a machete. Unless your agility is over 79, you can use a shortcut and you don't need them. Definitely bring stamina and prayer potions and some super defense because it's pretty cheap and it'll come in handy. A bunch of food, I teleport out, ideally to Varrock, since that's where we're headed after this. All right, we're headed here, but if you start at the GE, you can run to the spirit tree and take that to the gnome stronghold, then head to the grand tree and climb the ladder to the top level. Take the gnome glider to Gandius. From here, run south through the jungle and leap across the agility thing here. If you have 79 agility, you can use the shortcut over here, but for everyone else, we've got to hack our way through this forest mess. I'm turning the camera around to see a bit better what we're dealing with. There's actually a fairly easy route through if you could find it. Start with this jungle bush to the right of the rock, then another jungle bush directly after it, aka south, then another jungle bush to the left. At that point, turn the camera back around to face north, and there should be one more jungle bush to the south, and then hopefully you are through. Once you're through, head south through the jungle until you find the staircase. It should be south of the tree icon on the minimap. Ah, okay, now for the maze. You're gonna wanna make sure your auto retaliate is turned off. I'm going to spin the camera around so I'm facing south. Within this maze, there are floor traps that look like this and wall traps that are much harder to see, but you can kind of see a slight bit of discoloration. If you don't wanna get damaged by them, you have to click on them to disable them, which works sometimes. There are also stone guardians throughout the whole thing that will attack you. Red for melee, green for ranged, blue for magic. So same as Zolra, if you're familiar. So try to pray whatever they're attacking you with, but sometimes there are more than one attacking you and it's kind of hard to tell a color too. So uh, just do your best. Once you enter the maze, there aren't too many guaranteed safe spots because the guardians wander around. So just keep your eyes open. I'll play the footage of me going through the maze, but it's probably more helpful just to look at the map.
When you reach the end, grab the key piece. It will send you back to the beginning of the maze, but let's teleport the hell out of here. Next up, Mauritania. There isn't any combat in this section either, but you'll have an orb that deals 10 damage every time you use it. I'm wearing Dehide, still from the last section, but it isn't really needed. In your inventory, you'll want everything listed here. And quick note on the druid pouches. We will need to wander around the Mortmire Swamp a bit, and the guests will rot your food if you haven't built a special fire of dehumidification and don't have druid pouches. So bring a lot of food, but not your best food. Something even lower than monkfish would work. If you don't have any druid pouches laying around your bank, don't worry about it. If you've built the fire of dehumidification, you won't have to worry about gas taking your food. With all that in tow, head to the library in the Varrock Castle. Find Reldo and ask him about Tristan. We think his descendants have a key piece and we need to find them. He says we'll need to find a book containing census records to get the info we need. Search the second bookshelf on the right here to get a census records book. Talk to Reldo again. He thinks that Tristan's family might have moved from Mistailand to Mauritania. Ouch. All right, put on your ghost speak amulet or your Mauritania pants, because we're heading to Port Phasmatiz. Use your ectophile and then head into the city to the house just west of the bank. Go in and talk to Sarah. She says she buried her key piece in the swamp so the vampires wouldn't find it. We need to go talk to Ava and Drainer Manor to help us make a device to help find it. Use your Drainer Manor teleport or your Amulet of Glory, Drainer Village teleport, and run north. Head in through the manor and go find Ava. Search the bookcase and talk to her. Say you need help with a key piece and she'll tell you what to do to make a locator device. Also an interesting lore tidbit here, we learn that the Dragon Tear equipment is actually adventurer slang for the metal Orichalcum, which means canonically there is no logical reason why dragon dragons don't exist. Anyway, with the two molten glass and the dragon stone in your inventory, use the glass blowing pipe on the molten glass to get a locator orb. Talk to Ava again about the key piece and she'll finish off the locator functionality and warns you when you use it, it will damage you. Thanks, Ava. She also hints at the possibility of upgrading your accumulator. Next, we've got to find the key piece in Mortmire Swamp. Double check you've got your spade and then use whatever teleport method to get there. A salve graveyard, Kirill, or by using a fairy ring. The key piece will be in a random spot for each person, so unfortunately it's the old guess and check. You can use the locator orb to check which direction the key is from your current location. Also unfortunate is that the locator will deal 10 damage every time you check. Once you think you've kind of got the area narrowed down, I'd recommend just start digging because that doesn't deal any damage penalty. And when you find it, we've got half the key pieces! For this key piece, we take a boat from Relica and fight a dragon. Vorkath is a level 392 undead dragon. It is an instant fight, so if you die during it, you can retrieve your items for the 100k fee. He attacks with ranged, magic, and dragon fire, as well as melee if you get too close. His attack cadence will be 6 regular attacks, and then will alternate between 2 special attacks. The six regular attacks will randomly be one of seven types, and you can get multiples in a row. First, the melee attack, but only if you're within melee range. His magic attack is a light blue fireball that can hit up to 30 damage. If you pray protect from magic, you won't get hit for anything. His range attack is a spiky owl pellet thing that can hit up to 28 damage. If you pray protect from missiles, no damage will occur. Firebomb. It is avoidable, but if it hits you, it'll do up to 121. If you're on an adjacent square, it will deal half damage, so move away at least two squares to avoid the damage. There are three types of dragonfire attacks, and they have a max hit of 72 if not properly protected, but you can prevent all damage from these with the correct protection. I'll go over that after going through all of the attack types. 
The three types are just regular dragon fire, a teal dragon fire, which will inflict venom if you're not protected, a pink dragon fire turns off your prayer, and again, you can negate all the damage from these. I'll go over that in just a minute. After six of the above attacks, he'll alternate between the two following special attacks. First, the ice and zombie spawn, where he'll freeze you in place with an ice barrage type animation, and that doesn't deal any damage, but also generates this little zombie spawn dude with eight hit points a few tiles away in either direction. You've got to kill it before it reaches you or explodes on impact for up to 30 damage. Vorkath is immune to damage until the little guy is killed. It's actually a good idea to bring runes to cast the Crumble Undead spell, since that will kill him in one hit, but I just took my chances and tanked the damage when I didn't get to him in time. The other special attack is the Acid Attack, where Vorkath will launch a bunch of acid drops around the arena and then launch a stream of mini fireballs that follow you. If you walk through an acid patch, you'll get hit for rapid damage for about 3-8 to eight points each that will heal Vorkath. If you stop moving, his fireballs will deal about 10 to 20 each. So if you have to choose between stopping and walking through the acid, just walk through the acid. It's easiest for this entire fight if you just turn off your run to make it easier to keep moving without stepping in the acid. Try to find a nice empty row of tiles and then walk back and forth. I had the most success clicking a few tiles ahead of my current location. If it was directly next to me, there was a momentary stop in my motion and I'd get hit. To avoid taking damage from Vorkath's Dragonfire attacks, there are a few methods. Damage can be avoided 100% if you have a super anti-fire potion and an anti-dragon shield. You can cap it at 10 with an anti-fire potion and an anti-dragon shield. There's no extra effect praying protect from magic. You can also have a super anti-fire potion and protect from magic. And important note is drinking just an anti-fire potion or even a super anti-fire potion will do nothing to protect you. You have to pray either protect from magic or bring a shield. There are three common strategies to take Vorkath down. Crossbow and anti-dragon shield, toxic blowpipe, or melee with stab weapon. I actually beat him with a pretty bargain bin setup, just a rune crossbow with enchanted ruby bolts and blessed dragon hide. But of course, there is no reason you have to do that. I just always try and beat the boss with the cheapest gear I can. For the crossbow strategy, you want to boost your range attack while boosting defense across magic and ranged. The wiki lists Void Knight as best in slot for this, but I found that I was still taking a lot of damage when wearing my Void set, so I switched back to dragon hide. If you've got Armadil stuff, that is a great option, as well as Carol's set, and finally, good old Dragonhide can get you through too. For ammo, Enchanted Ruby Bolts are excellent for their special effect, which has a 6% chance of hitting 20% of the enemy's hit points at the cost of 10% of your own hit points. The wiki says to bring a swap after his health gets low, but uh, I actually didn't bother with this and just used Ruby Bolts the whole time. Just as a general note, Rings of Recoil do not work against Vorkath. The Toxic Blowpipe strategy is very similar, except that you won't be able to use the Anti-Dragon Shield, so you'll probably want to use Super Anti-Fire Potion and Pray Protect from Magic the whole time. If you opt for a melee setup, you're going to want a Stab Weapon to take advantage of his lower stabbed defense. You can pray protect from magic during the fight to negate any magic damage, so really wear the best melee armor that includes ranged defense. For inventory, first of all, you're going to need a way to get to Relica. If you're feeling like every inventory space counts, you can always bank at Sierra's village and walk. It's not too far. Or otherwise use a house teleport if your house is in Relica. An enchanted liar. From an Exceed Boots 4, or use a Waterbirth Island teleport and then take the boat, since that's actually super quick. Bring Anti Venom, preferably plus, Bastion Potion if you're ranging, or Super Combat if you're meleeing, Prayer Potion, your extended Super or regular Anti Fire Potion, a teleport out, and plenty of food. When you're ready, head to Relica. Go to the big building in the middle of town and talk to Brunt the Chieftain. Ask him about the Dragonkin Fortress. Brunt says there's a nasty beastie there, but Torfin on the dock will take you there. Head to the dock directly to the north of the fish stall to find Torfin. If you die and need to collect your stuff, Torfin is who you talk to. You'll be able to right-click collect on him. 
Remember, there is a 100k fee to recover it. Tell him you're ready, and away we go. A path here, and the fight starts as soon as you cross this little rock thing. I'll show the full footage of my fight in full for you to watch if you like, or you can just skip ahead to post fight. So here's a bit of a pre-fight checklist for you. Make sure run is turned off, have your quick prayers set to either your ranged or magic strategy, set your attack style to rapid attack or stab, drink anti-venom, drink your anti-fire, drink your stat boosters, turn your prayer on and go. Best of luck to you all. Ugh, can't run as soon as you're hit with the ice. I was still getting the hang of this. Luckily, he only hit me for zero there. Ah, nice, got the ruby bolt trigger there. Mmm, struggled a bit with the zombie guy, you'll see. Not sure if it was just the timing or my connection where it didn't seem to lock onto it until it was too late. Here you'll see I made a mistake by clicking too closely to my current location and the game sensed me as stopping. Got a pretty close to GG there. I got the little rascal this time. Mm, another mistake here. I waited too long to start moving and didn't notice that my anti-venom dose had actually turned to anti-poison. <laughs> you actually don't have to spam click here, just one will do it, but I think I was just adrenaline up.
Snuggle versus the zombie spawn. Will I get him this time? No. Really, I think this little guy has actually done more damage to me than Vorkath. Actually, let me check that. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Dumb mistake here. I let my prayer run out and didn't realize. We'll get some big range damage here. Ugh, dummy. There we go. Hopefully that far less than perfect fight has given you what you need to defeat him. Once he's defeated, you can climb over this rock to the north and then follow the path along. If you're super low on health or don't have any more anti-venom potion left, you might want to heal up and then come back. There are level 35 spiders that can inflict venom, and if you leave and come back you will not have to defeat Vorkath again. You'll see some stairs with this scary message. Check to see if your auto retaliate is on and turn it off if you need to. Down here, there's a lever on the west side of the chamber that unlocks a door on the east side. So make sure you have at least 15% of your run energy available. So that's why I'm walking here. As soon as you pull the lever, you've got 15 seconds to run to the other side of the chamber before the door closes. In here, search the stone chest to get both a key piece and a strange key. Make sure you've got them both and let's get out of here. And we're back to running through maze dungeons while stuff attacks you. But at least this time it's a relatively short maze and I actually think the easiest key piece. For this section, again, there isn't any direct combat and you won't need a weapon, just monsters attacking you as you run past. Hmm, this feels familiar. A good gear choice is the ever-popular dragon hide, or anything that offers good defense for at least two of the three attack types. For inventory, first of all, away to Shazian. If you've got Kered's Memoirs or Book of the Dead, the History and Hearsay Shazian option teleports you next door to the nearest bank, so that's great. Next best option is Xerix's Talisman to Xerix's Lookout, otherwise you could take the Fairy Ring to DJR. Also, the other stuff here, and for a teleport out, a games necklace is great since we're headed to the Barbarian Outpost after this. Make your way to Shazian, and then to this dungeon in the Graveyard of Heroes. Make sure your auto retaliate is turned off, turn your prayer on, and drink your stamina potion, then head down. This one isn't quite as maze-y. First level you run directly east. Take the ladder down, then head west. And north, and then take the eastern staircase. And then go south into this chamber in the middle. That wasn't too bad. Okay, the catch is you have to solve a riddle, and if you get it wrong, you get teleported to the beginning, but it isn't too hard. There are four statues, and you've just got to place them on the correct stands. If you inspect the tomb in the middle here, you'll get this long message. All you really need are these two lines in the middle, and this handy dandy little chart. So first, find the line, the one from some land, sat at the north of the table. Whoever corresponds to that land is who you're going to put on the north stand. In my case, Kamora is from Serantium, 
so she's going to go at the north position. Next line, opposite the one with some weapon. Again, use the chart to figure out who it is for you, and they will go to the south. For me, I'll put Tristan to the south since he's got the sword. The one with a weapon will correspond with who goes to the west. For me, Avis. And whoever's left over gets the final spot. Pick up each statue and use it on its respective plinth. If you're correct, you'll get a message that you hear a click. You can then search the tomb to get our final key piece. And we're out of here. If you have the game's necklace, use the teleport to Barbarian Outpost and head to the bank there. All right, let's put this key back together. For this section, we have to run past some mithril dragons, so most importantly, remember to grab an anti-dragon shield and make sure your prayer is replenished. For inventory, grab everything here. The runes are to cast Fire Wave three times, but I brought an extra just in case I somehow miss. If you want to bring a staff for one of them, you can. If you aren't already there, use a games necklace, teleport to the Barbarian Outpost, and then run south to this dock. Click on the whirlpool to dive in. It should take you to this cavern. If you instead end up on the bank of a river somewhere, you need to do more of Otto's Barbarian fire making lessons that I mentioned at the beginning. In the cavern, make sure your auto retaliate is off and drink your anti-fire potion and run south. I dumbly forgot to drink my anti-fire potion, so I was taking some hits here. Go up the stairs and then run west. You'll find a mithril door, which will open with the ancient key we found. It's safe in this chamber, so you can turn off any prayer you have. You'll need to cast Fire Wave on each of these three uh, dra dragon heads? Anyway, on each of these contraptions. When you head back out, go back down the stairs where we came up. From there, head south and west to the little nook in the far corner. There will be some rough hewn steps there. Again, it's a safe zone once you head up the steps. Run down the passage and you'll find this molten area. If you hover over this little lump, it will give you the option to smith, which will result in you reforging the key. All right, all right, we're going places now. That was a bit of a short section, but teleport yourself to the bank and let's continue. Next up, we're gonna run around and talk to a lot of people, so no fights, and you can change into your graceful if you want. For your inventory, it's mostly just a bunch of teleports around. When you're ready, use your dig site pendant teleport to Fossil Island, then take the magic mush tree to Mushroom Meadow and run south along the beach to get back to the boat we built before. Click on the boat to travel back to Lithgren. Run back northwest to that big chamber we went to before. Up the stairs, down the ladder. Down the passage. Oh look, it's Bob the Cat. Use your dragon key on the grandiose doors. Ah, new chamber. Run down to the very end to find Bob and Dallas. Cutscene time. Oh, this guy. Okay, turns out Undead Turkey over here is a few hundred year old dragonkin who created dragons as a weapon against humans and has spent the last few centuries creating a super dragon mutant who proceeds to wake up and start destroying stuff. You'll regroup with Bob and Jarvik and decide we need to alert some kings that there's a mutant dragon on the loose. So next up, King Roald in Varrock. 
for your Varrock teleport, you probably want to make sure to right click to set it to Varrock rather than the GE since I guess it's a few steps closer to the king. Head into the castle and talk to King Roald. Tell them about the dragon threat. He says they'll start gathering troops and we should go contact some other rulers. Next up, use your Ardoin teleport to talk to King Lathis and his castle. Basically, none of these conversations advance the plot at all. It's just like, he says, okay, cool. Next, head to Falador Castle. Head up the stairs in the western area. And then up the stairs again and talk to Sir Amic Vars. He says, okay, cool too. Next, head to Relica with whichever teleport you brought. Make your way to the center hall and talk to Chief Brunt. Ask about the dragon threat. <laughs> he says, okay, cool. All right, head back to Vrock Castle with our final teleport here. Talk to King Roald and he says, all the leaders are meeting in the dining room. Head in and click through a bunch of dialogue of them all chatting about what to do. Everybody aligns on a plan to take a fleet of ships to attack the dragons, although Sir Amic points out that boats tend to be made of wood and dragons tend to breathe fire. So there's that. At some point they'll ask your opinion, it doesn't really matter what you say. Once it's done, leave the room and talk to Bob the cat. Bob says that dragonkin are immune to weapons, so the only way to defeat the dragonkin is to defeat the super mutant dragon, since they're linked. And with that, it is time for the final battle. There are actually five parts to the final battle, but luckily each part acts as a checkpoint, so you only have to beat each part once, and you can freely teleport out to heal up between each. Also, if you die at any point, you can reclaim your items for your 100k fee. To get to the battle, you'll need to take the same boat we used for the Vorkath battle. So a quick overview of the final battle here. So part one doesn't involve any combat at all. It just consists of making repairs to the boat you're on for four minutes. Part two is a long agility course with a few dragon attacks and fights. Part three is just regular dragon fights. Part four is where Zorgoth and Galvik the mutant dragon show up and get involved. This section is broken into two waves of three dragons each. For this guide, I'm going to recommend teleporting out to bank after defeating the first wave, and then again after the second wave. First wave has a black steel and brutal red dragon, and then the second wave has a mithril, adamant, and rune dragon. And part 5 is the final big boy, we take on Galvec the mutant head to head. Depending on your combat levels and expertise, it might not be necessary to teleport out and come back, but just be aware there isn't a good place to pause after part 3 or 4. The good news is that parts 1 through 3 are actually pretty simple, and again, you don't have to do it all from the beginning each time. Bring your Dragonhide, Anti-Dragon Shield, Range or Bastion Potion, an Anti-Fire Potion, Food, and a Teleport Out. For part 1 only, you will need 4 empty spaces, so if you teleport out and come back to part 2, you can bring as much stuff as you want. If you are max level and you don't feel like you need a food restock after taking down three dragons over level 200, swap two of the food spots for an antidote potion and insulated boots. You can always bring them and see how you're doing along the way too. When you're ready, head to Torfin and Relica and you can ask him to take you to the fleet. The ship's integrity and time till arrival is marked on the upper left of the screen, so as long as there's still some green before the end of four minutes, you'll pass to the next part. All you have to do here is click on some disruption to fix it. There are four things that happen, a fire, a leak, an injured warrior, and a broken mast. If you want to leave for any reason, you can just click on the guy shouting orders to go back to the dock. So pretty simple. I don't even think there's any way to get injured in this section. On to part two. If your ship makes it to the end, you'll make it to part two, which is a long agility course with dragons mixed in here and there. Start by heading west off the ship. Head across the gap and jump onto this big ship. Here's where you should drink your anti-fire potion since on the next half boat, you start to get attacked by dragon fire. 
keep heading west across all the debris, and yes, everyone's favorite mechanic, you can fall in the water and retry the jump. The next ship has a red dragon you need to fight, but it's just a normal red dragon, no special attacks or anything. Continue onwards. There's another dragon attacking here, but clearly the far more dangerous element is this floating bit of wreckage that keeps damaging me. Now we start heading east across a bunch of obstacles. And then north once you pass the green dragon. This one's kind of unintuitive to find. There's a small square in the southeast corner of the boat. <laughs> More falling in the water, the true danger of this quest, clearly. But I guess it's not a grandmaster quest until you've failed an agility check at least 17 times. There's an iron dragon on this next ship you have to defeat, but it shouldn't give you much trouble. Continue on north off this ship. And then north some more. Next up we've got a brutal green dragon, which again is just a normal dragon fight. Keep heading west. and turn south along here. West again. And we're finally at the main ship. By climbing aboard the ship and talking to Bob, you've made it to part three. This little nook here is safe, and it's actually the last safe spot for the rest of the fight, so pause here and watch ahead for a moment if you haven't already. Part three is going to be super simple and quick. You'll just cross over this ladder, and then there are two blue dragons, two green dragons. Immediately after that is when Zorgoth and Galvec appear, and things start to get more interesting. After a short cutscene, you'll move into part four. Part 4 consists of 6 dragons, with your progress being checkpointed halfway, after the brutal red dragon. The fun twist is that Galvic launches a firebomb at you every 15 seconds, which can do up to 115 damage. So to not get hit, you're going to have to zoom and angle the camera so that you can watch Galvec, and every time he plays this animation, move a few squares away as you can get hit for damage on an adjacent square for half damage. So for the regular dragons that appear, first we've got a black dragon, which will attack with melee, so you should pray protect from melee for this one. I am not, because I'm a dummy that forgot. Next up is a steel dragon, which will attack with melee if you get too close, but otherwise sticks to dragon fire. Third is a brutal red dragon, which attacks with dragon fire and magic, as well as melee if you get too close. 
so pray protect from magic for the rest of the dragons in part 4. After the brutal red, it will act as another checkpoint if you want to head out and restock. At this point, a bunch of allies appear to help and occasionally do some damage, although all of the dragon attacks as well as Galvex stay focused on you. If you want to teleport out at the checkpoint, it's totally up to you and how your food supply is doing, and if you feel like you can take down another three dragons over level 300. Another thing to consider is that the dragons in the second wave are all weak to magic, so if you wanted to swap to magic gear, you can. Otherwise, it's completely possible to take them down with range, it just takes a bit longer. If you think you'll teleport out and bank after the first three dragons, go ahead now if you've been waiting at the safety nook. When you teleport out, here's a sample inventory. The only other things to note here are that if you do bring mage gear, make sure to swap your anti-dragon shield for super anti-fire potion, since that will protect against these guys. Also important are the insulated boots and the antidote or anti-poison. Okay, overview of the dragons in part 4.2. So next you'll have a mithril dragon which, as noted before, will attack with all three styles plus dragon fire. Ideally, pray protect from magic and stay out of melee range. After that is an adamant dragon, which is just like the mithril dragon, but with the added mechanic that it has a poison fire attack. So you will need your poison protection for this one. It also reduces damage if you walk away from it, which coincidentally may happen as you dodge Galvex attacks. It also has a chance of using a special attack that has the same mechanic as Enchanted Ruby Bolts, where it will use 10% of its own hit points to damage you for 20% of yours. For that reason, it's ideal to keep your hit points a little bit on the lower side if you can. Finally, for the Rune Dragon, which is a slightly stronger version of the Adamant Dragon. Instead of the poison attack, it has an electricity attack. So this is where it's helpful to wear your insulated boots, as they will reduce the damage you take. Its other special attack is a ranged attack that will heal itself for the amount of damage it does to you. After you take down the Rune Dragon, you'll get a fade to black, and it's on to part 5, the final fight. Again, if you want to teleport out and restock, that's probably a good idea. You no longer will need the insulated boots or poison or venom protection. Ranged is definitely your best bet for taking down Galvec. He's weakest to range and stab, but since you constantly have to run to dodge attacks, range gives you a lot more flexibility for not having to stand directly next to him. If you want to use melee, it's entirely possible, but for this guide I'm going to focus on more of the crossbow strategy. The other thing is that you really need an anti-dragon shield for this fight, because without it, his dragon fire will hit into the 50s. With a shield, plus a regular anti-fire potion, it's zero. So Toxic Blowpipe is out. Everybody grab a crossbow. Many of the same things apply to this fight as I outlined for the Vorkath fight earlier, so you could go Void if you wanted to max your damage at the expense of perhaps taking more damage, and also Armadil or Carol's armor would work nicely. Again for this fight, I defeated him with good old Blessed Dragonhide, although I did upgrade to a Dragon Crossbow from a Rune Crossbow. And again, I brought Enchanted Ruby Bolts, but I did swap to Enchanted Diamond Bolts once he gets down to low health. Galvec has a set of attacks that vary based on how much health he has, but these are his base set of attacks. First, Melee, which is only if you're right next to him. Firebomb, we know this move, you have to move or else. It's no longer fixed to every 15 seconds. It will occur as one of his regular rotations of attacks. Pink Dragon Fire, which will turn off your prayer. Orange Dragon Fire, which is a regular Dragon Fire attack. A White Magic Attack, which is a magic attack that will hit through prayer. And a Teleport Attack that will teleport you into melee range. Just move away quickly to avoid melee damage. After Phase 1, he starts to use a ranged attack as well, which can hit through a Protect from Missile's prayer. The fight is broken into several phases, depending on his hit points. First, the fire phase, from 1200 to 900 HP. You should pray magic for this phase, and the signature attack is that he'll launch this different type of bomb that will explode if you get too close. But they will always appear in the same place. For the first part of this fight, you should stay directly in the middle of the boat to not get hit by these, and when dodging his fire bomb attack, move vertically up and down the boat. His air phase is from 900 to 600 HP, and he'll move to the west side of the ship. 
There's no more spiky bombs from the previous stage, but he instead adds in a ranged attack and a stat drain attack. With this ranged attack for the rest of the fight, you should pray ranged from here on out. The stat drain attack will reduce all of your stats by two and your run energy by 40%. This will of course make it more difficult to dodge the firebombs as well as the tsunami attack in the next phase, so I included a super energy potion as an optional item in your inventory. The water phase is from 600 to 300 hit points. Galvec moves to the east side of the ship. He continues to use the ranged attack, but there's no more stat drain. Instead, the special attack of this phase is a tsunami wave thing that will start at either the north or the south of the ship and leave one gap open while moving across the ship. As you can see from the footage here, you still have to move north and south to avoid the firebombs. If you get hit by this wave, you'll take triple digit damage, so try not to do that. The earth phase from 300 to 0 HP. Galvec will move to the middle of the ship. If you're using ruby bolts and diamond bolts, make sure you switch by this point. The new attack for this phase is a rock that will prevent you from moving for a couple seconds if it hits you, which of course is bad news if he launches a firebomb. So when you see one coming at you, just move out of the way. For inventory, whatever gear you're using, plus potions and food. Remember to bring a restore potion since there is a stat drain attack. Also, if you're comfortable and familiar with using Saradamon Brews and Super Restores to heal, that is definitely another strategy that works. Before you go into the fight, make sure you turn your Auto Retaliate off. Okay, I'm going to roll the full footage of my fight for you to watch if you want. If you prefer to skip, go ahead and jump to the next section. Okay, moving into part two.
Now on to part three. And finally, part four. Waited a bit long to switch to my diamond bolts there, kind of forgot. Really getting down to it here with no more food left and 90 HP to go. But I got lucky with a really nice string hit here at the end. We beat Galvec! Yes! Congrats, that was a, that was a long one. Uh, poor Bob. Always leave your cat safe at home when you're fighting dragons, people. From here, we just need to talk to Alec Kincaid at the Myths Guild to wrap up the quest, which we can get to by using the Spirit Tree at the GE. As a reminder, the Bank in Berthorpe is found in the Rogue's Den, which you can get to through the trapdoor in the inn. From there, head back to the GE and take the Spirit Tree to Feldip Hills, and then on to the entrance of the Myths Guild. Tell Alec about your quest and we are done! But 
there are a few post quest goodies that I don't want you all to miss out on, so I'm going to go over those. There's quite a few cool things from beating this quest. First of all, access to the Myths Guild. On the ground floor, if you talk to Ellen, you can claim four lots of 25k experience in any combat skill for a total of 100k, so don't miss that. If you go through the statue here, there's actually a really neat basement area where you can charge dragonstone jewelry. There's a bunch of red, green, blue, and black dragons, adamantite and runite rocks, as well as the wrath altar. Upstairs, there's a range one square away from a bank chest, which is pretty cool. Talking to Primula will allow you to make super anti-fire potions. Well, that and 92 herb lore. You can get the super cool cape with unlimited teleports to the Myths Guild, plus it has pretty good stats. There's also a prayer altar and portals to the Champion, Heroes, and Legends Guilds. And of course, the most important thing of all, a pettable dog. You'll also have access to Lithkrin, where you can fight Adamant and Rune Dragons now. To get a shortcut there, bring your dig site pendant and run all the way back to this back tank where we saw Galvec first. And to the right, there's a strange machine. If you use your dig site pendant on it, you'll be able to teleport directly to Lithgrin for the future. You'll also have access to Vorkath as a boss you can fight, which has the same mechanics as the previous inquest fight, just with some upgraded stats of things. Well, that is it for this guide. Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope it helped you out. Uh, you should feel very proud of yourself for getting this quest done because it is massive and super annoying, as Grandmaster quests always are. But again, thanks for watching.